Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. Hammer all my day. The war in Ukraine, stoked in part by NATO expansion beyond the borders of a unified Germany, violating promises made to Moscow at the end of the Cold War, now looks set to become a lengthy war of attrition, one funded and backed by an increasingly bellicose United States. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, after a visit to Kiev, declared that, quote, we want to see Russia weakened to the degree that it can't do the kinds of things it has done in Ukraine. Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, during her own trip to Kiev, said that America will, quote, stand with Ukraine until victory is won. The Biden administration has requested another $33 billion in emergency military and economic aid, half of what Russia spent on its military in 2021 for Ukraine, a package congressional Democrats plan to increase by $7 billion. And this is on top of the $13.6 billion already allocated for Ukraine. The total U.S. troop numbers in Central and Eastern Europe has been increased to more than 100,000. Biden has signed into law a modern-day Lend-Lease Act waiving time-consuming requirements to fast-track weapons to Ukraine. What will be the consequences of the U.S. fueling this proxy war? How will Russia respond to the U.S. targeting of a dozen Russian generals for assassination and providing the intelligence to sink the Moskva, the guided missile cruiser that was the flagship of the Russian Black Sea Fleet? What will the war mean for the United States, Europe, and Russia? Could it escalate into an open confrontation between the United States and Russia? Why are the same cabal of generals and politicians that drain the state of trillions of dollars in the debacles in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, and Somalia, and learn nothing from the nightmare of Vietnam once again, able to push the United States closer and closer towards another conflict? Joining me to discuss the war in Ukraine and the consequences of a resurgent American militarism is Andrew Basevich, West Point graduate retired Army colonel and Vietnam War veteran. He is also an emeritus professor of history and international relations at Boston University and the co-founder and president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. He is as well the author of numerous books, including The Limits of Power, The End of American Exceptionalism, and his latest, After the Apocalypse, America's Role in a World Transformed. So I, as somebody who's followed American militarism and written, I think, very presciently on it for a long time, were you surprised, especially after the humiliating defeat in Afghanistan, that the war industry and the militarists would uh, uh, resurrect themselves so quickly? And then I also the public response is almost a, a giddiness to uh, a war fever that's gripped the country. No, I wouldn't say I'm surprised. Uh, the Afghanistan war did end in a humiliating failure. The Iraq war that began in 2003 didn't end in anything much better. So I think that in many respects, the national security apparatus was eager uh, to find a, a, an episode, an opportunity, uh, at least to divert attention from its own shortcomings, and at best, uh, to contrive some way of redeeming itself. And I think that's what Vladimir Putin inadvertently provided. You and I were both in Germany in 1989. Uh, NATO, formed in 1949, uh, was organized to prevent Soviet expansionism into Central and Eastern Europe. People spoke about the peace dividend. There were promises made, of course, not to expand NATO uh, beyond uh, Uh, the borders of a unified Germany. 
uh, the Soviet uh, collapse essentially left Russia defanged and weakened. Uh, what was your uh, – in that moment, uh, what did you think? I, I, I bought the line of the peace dividend, which shows you how naive I was. Uh, but you were in the military apparatus. W- what did you uh, see at that moment? What did you expect? Well, I think, uh, first of all, uh, I think uh, I, like almost any, everybody else, uh, who was an observer of U.S. foreign policy, of U.S. national security policy, was caught by surprise that the Cold War ended. I think the reigning assumption had come to be that the Cold War would go on forever, uh, it was a, that it was a permanent part of our world. Uh, and when it ended, again, me caught completely by surprise, I think I vaguely thought, vaguely, uh, that the United States would now become once for once more a normal nation, uh, in in some respects, uh, going back to what we had been prior to World War II, meaning minding our own business, uh, having a modest, in in terms of of size and cost, a modest uh, military establishment, refraining uh, from meddling and intervening in others' affairs. That was my expectation which, of course, was immediately demolished because the end of the Cold War actually triggered a new uh, uh, bout of American military interventionism uh, that really has spanned several decades now. Why? Why did that happen? Uh, Number one, I think because of the euphoria that the end of the Cold War created. You remember, I mean, the phrases that were in common usage, the indispensable nation, uh, a sole super po- a sole superpower, uh, the end of history having arrived, uh, with therefore American global primacy, something that could be uh, taken for granted. Certain expectations about American military prowess that I think stemmed from the uh, Iraq War of of uh, of of nineteen ninety two. If I'm not getting my dates confused. Uh, I think all of that created expectations that history was going our way. Uh, and uh, there was then the national security apparatus created during the Cold War that was now looking for things to do, looking for opportunities to maintain its relevance and therefore to provide a rationale for maintaining high levels of, of military spending. That's what the military industrial complex wanted. That's what the military industrial complex got. So we can't excuse, of course, what Putin has done. Uh, preemptive war, as uh, we carried out in Iraq, is under post-Nuremberg laws a criminal war of aggression. Uh, but clearly he was baited, uh, provoked uh, Russian complaints about the expansion of NATO and then uh, the stationing of troops in Eastern and Central Europe, something the Clinton administration promised Moscow it would not do. Uh, we we knew the the people who who followed uh, the Soviet Union knew uh, what they were doing and 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 the potential consequences of this. Why do you think do you think that they just thought Russia was so weak that they couldn't respond or what was the raison d'etre behind it? Yeah, I, Chris, I don't think I myself would use terms like baited and provoked. Uh, I see it more as the United States specifically, and the West more broadly, treating Russia uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union with utter disdain and contempt, uh, that in Washington, there seemed to be no reason in particular uh, why we should take seriously Russia's uh, national security concerns. Again, if we reflect on the mood of the moment, history having ended with one su- superpower remaining, we thought we could get away with every- anything. And of course, to some extent, uh, we did, at, at least for a decade or so uh, before 9-11 occurred uh, and, and brought those naive expectations uh, crashing down. Let's talk about the, the Russian military. You have written about, I think you call the Russian bears defanged itself, if I'm quoting you correctly. But it has really exposed 
the lie or the myth that somehow uh, the Russian military machine is a threat to Europe or to us, short, of course, of a, a nuclear war. Uh, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, you're right. When the Cold War ended, I was serving in what was then West Germany. And soon after the wall went down, I took my family to visit Berlin. We had never been to Berlin, despite the fact that we had lived in, we had served two tours uh, in, in Germany. And I remember one night that I, uh, taking my family, it was, it, was, it was winter, it was cold, it was wet. And we walked up the Unter den Linden, the main thoroughfare through the center of Berlin, approaching it from the side that had been the, the east and came up to the Brandenburg Gate, which of course was in many respects the preeminent material symbol of the Cold War itself. I just wanted to see it. Uh, and when we got there, what we saw was uh, a bunch of Russian soldiers sitting around with blankets on the ground. And in the blankets, they were selling Russian military trinkets, hats, wristwatches, uh, ribbons. Uh, of course, this is, in a sense, very exciting uh, for me to see firsthand these uh, these manifestations of the Russian military that I had uh, been studying and thinking about for many years. But what struck me at the time, it was, it was all junk. It was cheap. Uh, and and it, it, it was my first hint, I think, uh, that the Russian bear really wasn't 10 feet tall. Uh, and, and I think that the, uh, the, the course of the Ukraine war, the abysmal performance of of the Russian military, uh, and of course, let us acknowledge the 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 courage of the of the Ukrainian resistance. But nonetheless, the abysmal performance of the Russian military, I think, affirms the impression that I got way back then, uh, right when the Cold War had ended. They're not all that good. They're not all that tough. They're certainly not competent. In particular, they're not competently led. Let's talk about the Biden administration response. It's staggering sums of money, uh, you know, obviously close coordination with Ukrainian intelligence. Uh, uh, imagine, for instance, if uh, Russian intelligence had helped take out a dozen generals in Iraq or uh, Afghanistan. Uh, what's happening uh, and, and what are the, the potential consequences of – this heavy intervention in the Ukrainian conflict? Well, I think very broadly speaking, Chris, uh, when the Biden administration came to power, they, they quickly entered into what was an already an ongoing debate about the future of basic U.S. national security policy. And, and, and in that debate, there were two camps. The one camp, I think, argued strongly that uh, we, not simply the United States, but the international order, had entered into a new era in which common global threats needed to receive priority attention. And when I say common global threats, I mean, above all, the climate crisis. That was one camp. The other camp, consisted of people arguing that we were entering into a new era of geopolitical competition, great power competition. Prior to Ukraine, if you said great power competition, you were referring to the People's Republic of China as the principal adversary uh, that would pose against the, uh, against the United States. I think what has happened since the Ukraine war began is first of all, uh, the, the, the camp arguing that the future will involve great power competition it now, has, now is prevailing. Uh, and the amount of attention being received by more global threats, climate change, poverty, disease, those are being shoved off to the side. But the difference now, of course, is that the, the great power that Washington is obsessed with is not China, at least not to the extent that it was four or five months ago, but now it's Russia. 
Of course, there is this contradiction that Russia is not really a great power. They're a significant power. They still have, of course, that massive uh, uh, arsenal of nuclear weapons. Uh, but by no stretch of the imagination, whether we're talking economically, uh, militarily, ideologically, uh, does it make sense to to put uh, Russia in the rank of of uh, in, in the upper the uppermost rank of of of, of great powers? Nonetheless, <laughs> Putin has effectively hijacked U.S. policy uh, in ways that I think are not likely to be particularly helpful. Uh, to U.S. interests going forward. So this uh, group that you uh, identified as essentially uh, wanting to deal with uh, military expansionism, it, it's an old group. You've written about them, that Robert Kagan, uh, his brother uh, Fred Kagan, uh, Elliot Abrams. These people have been around a long time. I dealt with Elliot Abrams and Robert uh, Kagan when I covered the war in El Salvador uh, and Nicaragua. Uh, and yet they're wrong uh, about every uh, projection. I mean, they've just uh, justified every debacle after debacle, uh, and yet they still have this kind of prominence even within the Biden administration, figures like Victoria Nuland, who was married to Robert Kagan, this kind of incestuous. Uh, but talk about that group and their influence. I don't know if the influence of the specific group you're citing, and let, let, let's call them the neoconservatives. That's what we're used to referring to them as. I don't know that the influence of the neoconservatives is as great as it was, let's say, uh, back at the time of the 9-11 attacks, when they were, they were really in the saddle and they were riding high. That said, I think that the neoconservatives represent a, a strain of American militarism uh, that remains very powerful and and has become, in a sense, detached from the ideological conceptions that were very much part of the neoconservative worldview. I mean, the neoconservatives, I, I hope I'm not being unfair to them, uh, believed that the United States had a mission to spread uh, American-style liberalism democratic capitalism around the world. That's what we were called upon to do. Uh, and that with the end of the Cold War, we were in a position to put American military power to work in order to achieve that, that, uh, that end. I don't know that that's where we are today. You know, that the, the democratizing impulse, it seems to me, is not nearly as, as prominent uh, in our politics. It hasn't vanished. But but it's but it's not as prominent. Uh, nonetheless, uh, the the insistence that the insistence upon the United States exercising global primacy of continuing to be number one, a position we've become accustomed to having uh, ever since the end of World War II, I think that conviction remains. So it's less about a mission to spread democracy. It's more about a conviction of history having chosen the United States uniquely uh, to preside over the future of humankind. Although the Ukraine conflict, those are the words they use, a fight for democracy, a fight for liberty against tyranny. Oh, I think I think that's fair. I think that's fair enough. Uh, I, I mean, I think that... It's an absurd uh, characterization, uh, but but it, it is it is kind of a language that that American politicians and and public commentators uh, reflexively return to uh, that whatever it is we're doing in the world somehow it connects to freedom, connects to our commitment to democracy. Uh, any any serious student, I think, of U.S. foreign policy has has long ago come to the conclusion that that's all nonsense. Uh, but the, the vocabulary continues to, to resonate in a way. You know, you know, it'll, it'll get your op-ed printed in the Washington Post or whatever. It'll get you invited on, on the Sunday talk shows, uh, even if uh, it's not to be taken very seriously. 
I mean, I, I would argue that if you want to know what, why we do what we do in the world, why we, why we're, why we are intent on giving that additional $40 billion of, of support to Ukraine, uh, our, our belief in, in freedom and democracy, uh, I think, uh, is a lot more, less important, uh, than the, the demands of the military industrial, industrial complex. Or I should say, the military industrial congressional complex. It's a staggering sum of money, and it seems to indicate that they expect this war to go on for a long time. Can you talk about the war itself uh, as somebody who comes out of the military, what you've seen, uh, what you how what you expect? Uh, there's a kind of nonchalance among the war makers about pushing Putin, uh, and and he has the raise the specter of nuclear weapons, uh, but just talk about the war itself, what, what, what you've observed. Yeah, you know, I, I, I should, I, should uh, I don't want to come across as a military expert. I've been out of the Army longer than I was ever in the Army, so I am, I'm an interested observer. Uh, and, and what I have observed is this, uh, staggering incompetence on the part of the Russian military. And, and this incompetence is certainly attributable in part to the guys at the top. It's certainly attributable to a large extent to the, to the Russian officer corps. They have be- performed very badly. Uh, and we have to acknowledge uh, the courage and determination of, of the Ukrainians who have benefited greatly by the flow of advanced weaponry uh, provided by the United States and, and others in the West. Uh, that said, uh, the war has gone on much longer than most observers expected, longer than I expected. Uh, it does not appear likely uh, that either side uh, currently enjoys anything like a decisive edge. And therefore, uh, if the political leadership on each side uh, is determined to continue the struggle, uh, until some kind of favorable outcome is is achieved, then this war could go on for a very, very long time. Uh, I think that's where we are. Now, uh, you alluded to nuclear weapons. Uh, I am in complete agreement. Uh, I think it is appalling uh, and frightening uh, that there is casual talk about the possibility of nuclear weapons being used. Maybe I should call it dismissive talk, not not anything for us to seriously worry about. I think that is exceedingly, exceedingly dangerous. Uh, and the other thing I think is that that it, it I'm equally appalled uh, by the absence of attention to the imperative of winding this war down. I mean, it it has to come to an end. The sooner it comes to an end, the better. Uh, but the United States, the Biden administration, uh, seems to have remarkably a little interest in exploring, pursuing, promoting uh, some type of a diplomatic resolution, at least to get the get the shooting to stop, uh, so that then further negotiations can can continue. I think equally appalling, and this is where all the language of of punishing Russia. Uh, enters into the conversation. Uh, equally, equally appalling, I think, is the lack of attention to to what's going to happen. Where will we be when the war finally ends? The day the fighting stops, Russia is going to be a pariah state. It's going to be an angry state. Uh, if there is to be the restoration of something like uh, stability uh, in in Eastern Europe then Russia's pariah state is going to have to be unwound. Uh, We're going to have to find a way to bring uh, uh, Russia back into uh, the community of nations. Maybe not not with Putin in charge, uh, but there's there's going to be a Russia problem uh, that is going to demand lots of attention. I I am usually the first one to, uh, to, to reject, you know, historical analogies Related to the to the 1930s and the origins of World War II, but I do think it's worth considering that 
the, the, the punishment imposed upon Germany as a consequence of the settlement of, uh, that followed World War I, followed the so-called Great War, did set the stage for a war that turned out to be orders of magnitude worse. Uh, we don't want to repeat that error. Uh, and, and therefore, we need to be thinking about uh, finding a way to end the war and then finding a way to, to bring Russia back into the community of nations. This will have domestic consequences. Certainly, military budgets will go up. Uh, they're, they're already staggeringly high. Uh, and they will have international consequences in the, with a resurgent uh, kind of uh, militarism by the United States. Can you talk about the, 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 those consequences uh, f- from, from this conflict? You know, I'm not sure I'm with you, Chris. Uh, the budget, the, the, the military budget was already going up even before the war started. And, and, it, and it's, it is not a controversial issue. Uh, it does not seem to be a matter that the American people attend to. You know, the military spending goes up and collectively we, we sort of nod and say, well, okay, that's that. Seems to me that from, from Biden's point of view, uh, it's domestic issues uh, that he will likely be much more attentive to as, as things go along. Inflation is going to kill him. Uh, the, uh, the, the potential uh, overturn of, of Roe v. Wade uh, could have uh, enormous uh, consequences for, for, for domestic politics. So it's an interesting thing that, you know, the Ukraine war is, uh, I guess it's the biggest war we've experienced over the past couple of decades, even bigger, I think, uh, in terms of overall damage than, uh, than the Iraq war. Uh, and I'm not sure it has much of an impact on our politics. Well, it does in the sense that you're diverting resources or continuing to de- divert resources to the military while... Uh, half of this country lives in a state of poverty or near poverty. Social services collapse, the infrastructure collapse, uh, and, and of course it's running up deficits. I agree with 100% in agreement there. Uh, but it, it seems to me that the, the, the politics of the moment uh, in, the, in the era of Trump or Trumpism, if I can, if I can call it that, uh, was not conducive to seriously addressing the domestic afflictions that were to beset the country. You mentioned some of them, you know, the persistent poverty, uh, the, 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 the overall political dysfunction. I mean, I, I, I happen to define myself, I'm not sure why these days, I happen to define myself uh, as, a, as a conservative. Ostensibly, the Republican Party uh, is the party of conservatism. The present day Republican Party stands for nothing in terms of, of principles. There is no principled conservative political party uh, in the United States today. Uh, but it, it doesn't seem to me that uh, the, the Ukraine crisis in any way uh, offers uh, uh, an avenue uh, toward dealing with, with the domestic problems that, that beset us. It's something that's happening over there, far away. Uh, and, you know, it, it, there are really no immediate costs imposed upon the American people. The Iraq War became contentious for a time because there were significant U.S. casualties being sustained. We're talking back in 2004, 2005, 2006. In this war, there are no U.S. casualties. Uh, And I think the American people seize upon that fact to simply tune out the war. It has nothing to do with us. I mean, I don't buy that. I think it has a lot to do with us. But I I think that what we have seen, particularly since the creation of the all-volunteer force, uh, after Vietnam, that if Americans aren't getting killed and wounded, then the American people don't pay much attention to the wars that uh, we're involved in. Great. We'll stop there. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron 
Granadino, Adam Coley, Dwayne Gladden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com. Thank you.